welcome to all attendees, um, those who those of you who are joining us on our uh, Zoom, this Zoom webinar, and also those of you who are also joining us on our other social media pages, Facebook uh, and also YouTube as well. Um, so thank you very much for spending your time with us for this webinar in conjunction with World Ocean Day. Um, so the International Science Council, Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific, um, together with the Mahadev Science Award Foundation and the Academy of Sciences Malaysia have jointly organized uh, today's webinar. Um, this webinar is a part of a TROPSI Trops webinar series, The Future Belongs to the Tropic. Um, so just a bit of a background, um, as part of this webinar series, we have organized uh, various other webinars in conjunction with um, other World Days. For example, recently we had one for uh, Biodiversity, World Health Day, uh, World Forest Day, and also International Mountains Day. So if you are just joining us for the first time, you can view all of our previous webinars that we have organized on our Facebook page. Um, you know, feel free to share them to all of your networks and also your colleagues. Um, and do, do stay in touch because we will have um, you know, other webinars that we plan to organize. Um, so now without further ado, I would like to invite uh, academician Dr. Mazlan Othman, the director of the ISE Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific, and the chair of TROPSI 2021 conference to say a few words. Hello everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. I'm not sure um, where, you're, where you are at, but thank you so much for joining us uh, this time. Um, again, as I said, welcome to the series of webinars on the theme of the future belongs to the tropics. I'll explain to you a little bit more about the webinar series. But before we go on to today's webinar, allow me to give some insights on why we think the future belongs to the tropics. Some of you who have joined us before will know the statistics I'm about to give you, but for those who have not, um, let me um, update you that the, you, we know that the tro tropics is resource rich. Now as a region, it accounts for 40% of the world's total surface area, but it hosts nearly 95% of the world's mangroves and hosts approximately 80% of the world's biodiversity, 54% of the world's renewable water resources are in the tropics. And this is one I really like to say, 82% of the world's living languages are spoken in the tropics. Um, by 2050, this is important, the region will host more than half of the world's, po uh, uh, half of the world's population, <coughs> sorry, and two-thirds of the children. At the same time, 85% of the poorest people in the world live in the tropics. So it is clear that while trop the tropical nations have made significant progress over the years, they also face a variety of challenges that demand focused attention across a range of development indicators and data in order to achieve sustainable development. Now, to propel the attention of scientists and policymakers to the tropics, the Academy of Sciences Malaysia established the Mahade Science Award that gives away uh, 100,000 US dollars to scientists yearly, to scientists who make significant contributions to tropical sciences. To support this prize, we are organizing the International Conference on Tropical Sciences, their contributions to sustainability, or TROPSI, uh, on 25th to the 27th of October this year. As you can imagine, it was postponed from September of uh, last year, and we will be having a virtual meeting of TROPSI. Now, we will continue to hold activities to build awareness of the goals of uh, TROPSI 2021, naturally to attract participation among policymakers, implementers, both in the private and public sectors and researchers. Now, um, Sophia already hinted at it. So far, we have, we have had eight webinars uh, from last year covering the topic of mangroves, youth, engineering for sustainability, coffee, our favorite, Black Gold of the Tropics, tropical cities, tropical mountains, tropical forests, and recently, tropical biodiversity. 
Now today, today we will present to you a webinar in conjunction with World Ocean Day. You'll notice if you look back at our conference, uh, at our webinars, they are always held in on some international day, which makes the branding rather easy. And today we will focus on the theme of life and livelihood in the tropics with regard to World Ocean Day. Now, we, are, we have heard this before, the ocean covers over 70% of the planet, right? But what is important for us is that 76% of the tropics is ocean. Now, as I got to be more involved in the webinar preparation, I got to learn more and more about ocean. This is really terrific when this webinar is really giving me a chance to do that. But the picture that really got me is this. Uh, I know Martin will show you another picture. Uh, can can uh, I, I know that the um, the, uh, the oh sorry the pole is in front of the picture. Can you take down the pole? Somebody take down the pole. Okay, I, I should get Okay, right. So the world ocean map, according to Spielhouse, is a Spielhouse kind of projection. Is this, and you can see the five oceans. I like this map because it is uh, shows you in terms of uh, reality the area, the land area versus the uh, water area, the ocean area. So you can see very clearly um, how beautiful uh, it is through this ocean. Um, which is our ocean, just one ocean. And I'm so delighted that I've got Martin this back today to talk to you about this one ocean. He was, I was delighted uh, to have his, to see his, his diagram actually. So apart from Dr. Visbeck, we will have, we have an awesome lineup of experts to highlight the issues and a very competent moderator to curate our discussions. So let me not uh, hold you back anymore. I hope you will get much insight and inspiration from our discussions today. You'll see me again when I wrap up for five minutes, bear with me, but I'll see you again in one and a half hours. Okay, enjoy. Thank you very much for the welcoming remark. Um, so before we move into the um, keynote speech, uh, let, let me just give you, uh, the attendees uh, you know, a bit of information on some of the housekeeping rules. Um, you know, we, we really want uh, the attendees to be really engaging with our moderators, so feel free to ask your questions in the Q&A section. Um, there will be a panel discussion and the moderator will you know, try and all the speakers will try to answer the questions that you have uh, asked. Um, so, you know, feel free to answer in the Q&A section and we will uh, try to address them in the webinar. Um, so, moving on, we are very pleased, uh, as Professor Mazla mentioned, to have Prof Professor Martin so, Visper. Sorry, uh, Sufyan, can I uh, intervene? That we will be putting up poll questions for you. There will be four poll questions we put out every 15 minutes. And at the end of uh, when I wrap up, I'm going to present to you the statistics for those polls. Thank you. Yes, uh, the, uh, the, the, the polls will come up, will pop up on your screen from time to time, so don't be alarmed. Uh, and, you know, we, we, do, we, do, we do appreciate uh, the, the responses from the attendees. Um, so, again, moving on, we are pleased to have Professor Martin Visbeck um, to give the keynote speech on the overview of the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. Um, so just a bit of introduction, uh, Professor Visbeck serves as a member of the Executive Planning Group of the UN Decade. Um, uh, the, the, the group serves as an advisory body to the International Oceanographic Commission of UNESCO governing bodies, uh, with the main task to provide advice on the form and structure of the decade, to support the development of the implementation plan, as well to engage and consult relevant communities. Uh, so Professor Martin Visbeck is also a member of the IIC governing board, and chair of the ISC Committee for Outreach and Engagement. So we have with us today, you know, the, the, the perfect person to give you the overview of the UN Decade. Um, so without further ado, I would like to invite uh, Professor, Ma Professor Martin to give the keynote speech. Thank you very much and welcome colleagues, Maslam. Thank you very much and Sufran for the invitation, for introducing me and for allowing me to be here with you this morning for me, afternoon for you, to talk about the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development that just started this year. 
in Muslim indeed, uh, here is also another version of the Spielhaus projection ocean map. And you know, we and sometimes we talk about world oceans with an S. And I always say, drop the S. There's only one planet and one ocean. And you'll yep. hear me in a moment why I mean that. So uh, moving on, uh, let me share with you first a picture of our planet Earth, not in Spielhaus Mercator projection for where the lights, uh, uh, lights at night will look at you. If you look, at, take the clouds away, tropics are clouds free here for once. And you see where people live and have their lights on at night. It's pretty amazing to see uh, uh, how a display is of where all the energy rich people live, let's say Europe, North America, Japan, but also you, you, you see sort of, uh, certain India showing up, Indonesia, Malaysia is there. But when you look more closely, you see these, all these lights are near the coast. So what is it? Why do people enjoy living near the coast? You might say it's the beauty of the ocean, other reasons, but I think today the main reason comes from this graphic. This graphic shows you the shipping routes of container vessels connecting the world. 95% of all the com commercial traffic goes via ships over the ocean. And if you're near the coast, you can partake in the global economy, which even in Corona times is a big plus. So living near the coast is a really an economic advantage. We call it sometimes the blue economy. Now, uh, when you look although where people live, uh, Maslam said it, the tropics is very red here. Lots of people live in the tropical belt. So obviously the tropics is very important for us on the planet and certainly also important for the ocean. If I can add some numbers, uh, uh, I find that amazing. Look at the world population. We as good scientists should study the literature here. And when I was born in the 60s, there were 3 billion people on the planet. And now we have 4.8. So in my lifetime, in my generation, the world's population has doubled. That is amazing. And that is because we had access to energy, uh, health, uh, and, and things like that. If you look into the future, we see that we're going to have maybe 50% more, about 10 or 11 billion by the end of the century. So where does this growth, this population growth happening? This has not happened in Europe, where I live. If you look at the numbers for Europe here, these are the green numbers. It's pretty flat. It's been in Asia. It's the tropics again, Muslim, where we saw this great expansion of the population up to now. But if you look in the next 50 years, you will see that Asia will more or less flatten. You will almost reach the peak of world of the population in density. But Africa is now coming up next. So I think it's really important to pay attention to the tropics, to the global regions, and are these countries well prepared for them, you might ask. Now, this growing population only has one planet and one ocean to go around. So I think it is really something to keep in mind when you think about development of the planet, tropics in particular, that we're really asking ourselves, what is this question for development? What's a safe and just landing space for humanity? I can speak for hours about that, but I won't. But that recognition that this is a tough question has led to the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, balancing out all these ambitions that humans have and looking for ways how we can get to that for this generation, the next generation, and many generations to come. Now, in the ocean, and we are looking at this system and trying to understand what are the pressures on the ocean system. You might have heard about climate change leading to warming, sea level rise, in the tropics in particular, coral reef bleaching, loss of mangroves, but also pollution. Things like plastics are very much in your face, but also nutrients, other types of pollution. So a lot of the science is about understanding the human pressure on the ocean systems, and sometimes, Muslim, they look at us and say, you just have bad news. You just talk about the bad things of the ocean. But that's actually not true. There's also a lot of science supporting resilience, in particular in the tropics. How can we regrow, restore, use nature-based solutions, say for mangroves, for coral reefs, and in particular in coastal communities. So there's a lot of science thinking about how we can increase the resilience of the ocean. At the end of the day, what we're all looking for is pathways to sustainable ocean prosperity. We want to benefit from the ocean on the one hand, but also protect it. So we want to bring use and protection, the use of the ocean, the blue economy and the protected ocean together. And that, I think, is an amazing agenda. And that is the agenda of the UN decade of ocean science for sustainable development. The vision is, what is the science that we need for the ocean that we want? 
the International Science Council is a science-driven organization, the Malaysian Academy is, all your tropical friends around there, what is the scientist's role in this? And the mission is, how can we come up with transformative ocean science solutions, supporting sustainable development, connecting people and the ocean in new and exciting ways. Let me give you a little film here. Just last week was the first international launch of the decade. And let's hear from some of the world leaders about what they think about the ocean decade. The ocean acts as a climate machine, economic space, and a source of food for many, many people around the globe. And I would like to invite all of you to join us for a dive into the unknown secrets of the ocean. The future of our Earth thus heavily depends on how we treat our oceans. Germany has proved itself to be a competent and reliable partner in this field. We need to start living in harmony with the ocean. It's time for a revolution in ocean science. And this revolution now has a name, the United Nations Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. Together, let us discover the science we need for the ocean we want. This uh, decade offers a unique opportunity, a clear framework for action by better coordinating global efforts. We are very much aware that to reach our European Green Deal ambitions, and make Europe a climate neutral continent by 2050, we need healthy oceans. The agreed ambition of the G7 to tackle climate change, which of course is such a stressor on the ocean system. The ocean is our future. It's become increasingly obvious that ocean science must be the foundation upon which the achievement of SDG 14 is built. I can tell you that uh, we do not have time. We have to act now. There's a lot of traditional knowledge in our region built up over millennia uh, that we could make use of in the global science community. You have to think seven generations ahead. And this is preserved through a process which they call Rawi. So in certain places, when they fish, for example, on the reef itself, there is a section that they have to block, which is taboo, that no one's touched it. We need international organizations and we need the willingness to protect uh, us from illegal fishing. We, while we are trying to find solutions for a different future, for a different ocean, we have to learn to be resilient, to adapt to the things to come. It needs to be part of our jobs to think about partnerships. You know, for us, it's about um, transforming uh, the industries as they are now into, into a sustainable future. I think this next generation is um, ready to take on this challenge, especially if the international community does what the Ocean Decade is doing here today. I think that we need to improve the way we communicate science to the general public. So you see some exciting words from around the globe about how the ocean is important to our future, where the opportunities are, which type of knowledge we have. And the decade has laid out 10 challenges to look at the ocean ahead of us. And one is to understand and map land and sea-based sources of pollutants and contaminants and think about uh, ways in which develop solutions to mitigate or remove them. I think a very timely challenge in particular for the population rich tropical regions. To understand and affects the, the effects of multiple stressors on the ecosystems. So solution to protect, monitor and manage and restore ecosystems and their, uh, their biodiversity nature-based solutions. How can we contribute to sustainably feeding the world's population? It's about the food from the ocean, not only fish, but also our bivalves and algae are much more sustainable then. And we need to generate the knowledge to support innovation, develop solutions to contribute to equitable and sustainable development of the ocean economy, very much at the heart of many tropical coastal regions. They wanna to look to grow the ocean economy, but how can you do it in a sustainable and equitable way? There's challenges around the ocean climate nexus, an area of research that I'm personally involved in, 
what is the role of the ocean and climate change and how does the ocean influence climates, looking at whether uh, climate variability, monsoons, El Nino, but also climate change. We can do more there and we should in the, during the decade. We wanna expand our multi-hazard warning system for all sorts of hazards around ocean, from tsunamis to harmful algae blooms to hurricanes uh, and, and sea level rises, things like that. Certainly we need a sustainable ocean observing systems with all the actors involved. I do a lot of work in there and I really encourage all of you from the tropical regions to think about what it is, how you can contribute to an ocean observing system and a digital representation of the ocean. I'll speak about it at the end. And uh, last but not least, but very important is comprehensive capacity development and to facilitate equitable access to data, information, knowledge, and technology, really something where we want to work together around the globe to enable all people around the planet to participate in ocean knowledge and benefit from that. And last but not least, to ensure that multiple values of the ocean for human well-being, culture, and sustainable development are recognized and widely understood and identify and overcome the barriers to the behavior change that is required for a step change in humanity's relationship with the ocean, really a new way in which we interact with the ocean. So the decade has laid out what we call an, a framework of action. And what we mean by action is, it's the academies of the world that are bringing about the knowledge, but it's also the society around us that brings in their knowledge system, traditional knowledge, practical knowledge, economic knowledge, and all of that against these challenges that I laid out is helping us to define our ways into the future. But it's in particular also looking at the young people here. You see some of the young world leaders, the Malati sisters, for example, from Indonesia there, Kenny from Ghana, from Africa. We certainly see Greta Thunberg, a climate activist, and Vicky from China. All of these generations can work with us to look into the future. So what are we doing at GEOMA where I work in order to bring and work with others? We have a strong partnership with the tropical islands of the Cape Verde that's off Senegal, Africa. And here we built together with the Cape Verdeans an ocean science center in Mendelo where we support observations in the tropical region. We have a master's program for all West African students so they can learn about ocean science and climate science. And we're really working with the local community of Cabo Verde how for a small island development country, the ocean is the economic future and how they can use that future wisely. The second point I wanna make for us looking into the future is one of harnessing the digital revolution. Uh, we have observations, we use the observation increasingly in data and model systems, we share them around the world and we wanna generate that knowledge that we share with all of you. In Europe, uh, we are well set up. So we have satellite systems looking at the world, uh, including the ocean. We have observing system for Europe, but these are also globally, global ocean observing system. We have a marine service organization that does weather forecasts uh, for the ocean, ocean forecasts on climate and shorter time scales. We have eModnet and data holding systems like IODE globally, and we have cloud computing and cloud networks. And our vision is to build out what we call a digital twin of the ocean, a digital representation of the ocean that we can use to explore the ocean, discover the ocean, but also plan solutions of the ocean into the future. So the digital opportunity is a fantastic opportunity to really think about solutions in the future, plan them in the virtual world, and then roll them out in the real world for a better future for us all. So colleagues, the decade has articulated seven outcomes that we wanna see over the next decade to come about. We want a clean ocean, a healthy and resilient ocean, a productive ocean, a predicted ocean, a safe ocean, an accessible ocean, and an inspiring and engaging ocean. Thank you very much. And I hope and I, we can really together really build out that science that we need for the ocean that we want. And I'm looking forward to the discussion with all of you later in the program. Uh, th thank you very much, Professor Martin, for that you know, very good uh, overview of the UN decade. And he certainly brought up a lot of topics um, that will be dis discussed during the um, you know, speaker sessions, for example, blue economy, climate change, um, and also the, the importance of youth. Um, so 
Um, so thank you very much to Professor Martin. Uh, we will we, he will we will see him again during the panel discussions. And if you have any questions to him, uh, please uh, put it forward in the Q and A section. So now we will move on to the panel session, which will be moderated by Miss Cheryl Rita uh, Ko. Um, so without further ado, I will pass on this webinar to uh, the moderator, who will then moderate the panel session. Thank you very much, uh, Sufian, uh, and thank you also to the uh, organizers for having given this opportunity to me. I think as I'm really delighted to moderate this session with a rich uh, panelist. Uh, I think we have uh, speakers from around the globe, uh, Malaysia, the region, and also international. Um, in the interest of time, um, I think the housekeeping uh, notes has been given by uh, Sufian already. Uh, each of the speakers will be given about 10 minutes uh, for their presentation, but we will have the opportunity to better discuss, to, to go into further details in the panel discussion session uh, later on. So without further ado, uh, we have uh, the first speaker for this afternoon is going to be uh, Professor Edwin Eldrin from Indonesia, uh, who will be speaking on the tropical oceans and climate change. And if I can just very briefly introduce Professor Edwin Eldred, he is a professor of meteorology and climatology at the Agency for Assessment and Application of Technology, Indonesia. He, is, uh, he currently also serves as uh, the IPCC Working Group 1 Vice Chair, representing Indonesia and countries in the Southwest Pacific region. A uh, very apt, uh, Professor Edwin, uh, I pass the floor to you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, moderator. I think Professor uh, Masran and I also want to recognize uh, Professor Martin Pitbeck from the UN Center. I would like to take the theme Tropical Ocean and Climate Change. I'm uh, Professor Edwin Aldrian, work for BBPT as Professor of Meteorology and Climatology. I also have uh, IPCC working with Bureau as working in group one, five chair. Okay. Uh, then I will continue. Uh, this is uh, our earth. This is uh, uh, the tropic and uh, the polar region has divided since we are in the tropic receive uh, solar radiation very much. So that's why we receive short, uh, short wave radiation in the tropic too much. So we distribute the energy to the tropic, to the high latitude. Uh, this is our task. So, and then uh, we have a surplus of energy we give to the high latitude region. This is uh, our task of as the world energy balance. Uh, among the archipelago, we, we are in the uh, maritime continent country. We are located in the two continents and the two uh, ocean. This is where Indonesia and Malaysia are located. Our country is a marine, marine type climate due to small island effect. And then we are in the monsoon and region and, and so dominated climate system. The Indonesian crew flow is uh, the biggest uh, crew flow to bring warm water to the Pacific, to the Indian Ocean. It should give you uh, crew flow all the way. So we are the climate regulator. We are in the Hartley and uh, water cell to the east, to the west, and uh, to the north, to the south. And we are, this, the, as I said in the beginning, is a, a distributor of uh, the energy source from the solar radiation and light and heat re relief. We are a location of the many of uh, depth uh, precipitation in the tropic. So most of the energy will be produced and absorbed in the tropic. And then this is our duty to uh, introduce uh, to distribute this energy to the world. So this is our water reward. 71% of the world uh, surface is water. And then this is our, our uh, climate system is also very much controlled by the world climate, by the water system. So the what's going on with the climate system uh, as we have a warming ocean this is, uh, can be simulated by uh, crystal ball. If you if you put the crystal ball with water, half of that, and then you put a candle light in, at the bottom, and then you put the ice at the top. Uh, if you warm from the 
a pixel ball by adding some candle at the bottom, you will have the intensifier uh, water water balance and intensifier water uh, water cycle. This is what happens if you get warmer ocean, and then it will give you uh, consequently the the tropics will become larger, and then uh, you have a new tropical area. This is what happened right now. So the rise of the surface temperature in the ocean will have impact on sustainability and survival of new ecosystem in the land and coastal area. Tropical disease will propagate, propagate and coastal disease will rise to the mountain. Changing in plantation and the crop season is our competition to the, uh, our situation. And then there are large consequences of the impact of uh, larger uh, tropical belt will be uh, the newly tropical region, the salinity of the tropical will decrease, global thermohaline circulation decrease, and the decrease of surface temperature in uh, tropical and tropical countries, and so on like that, uh, including the acidification of the ocean and atmospheric system. So we now have, uh, uh, I think, the uh, Great Ocean Confire Belt. This is uh, introduced by scientists in uh, around 2000, and then they put uh, so many buoy, and then they study about this. So our archipelagic system in Indo-Malaysia, archipelagic system actually control the world because uh, the the water coming from the Pacific Ocean will flow past to the archipelago to the Indian Ocean. Okay, this is uh, the schematic figure, uh, a little bit detailed. So we have here uh, on the Borneo Island, uh, on the South Borneo Island, this is uh, the controlling system. So most of the what happened in the polluted area, we have the polluted area, for example, in Thailand Bay, which is pushed back to the Pasi and so on, pushed back again to the Thailand area. So we have uh, the the Makassar Strait between Borneo and Makassar, very high uh, temperature increase because of the uh, from the North North Pacific area, the temperature different to the tropical is getting smaller and smaller. This is not happening in the other part of the eastern part of Indonesia, so it is like it. So this is the effect of uh, global warming. So another effect of global warming is that uh, the the channel, the Indo I say the Indonesian group of which flow the water from the Pacific to the Indian Ocean is getting weaker, weaker and weaker because of the the weak, weaker and then the degree of different of temperature change of the of the north and the tropical area is getting smaller and smaller. So this is a consequence of that. So you must I must imagine that what happened in the Population of uh, fish and so on, like this. And then uh, we see the uh, tropical area. This is this is a study by uh, Al Gore because he, he, he study what is it, the greenhouse gases in the Mauna Loa. He said the up and down, uh, up and down, up and down, like this. This is actually what happened if we have uh, because the earth system we have so many forests. The land area in the northern part, northern hemisphere is too much. Uh, compared to the southern hemisphere. So most of the southern hemisphere considered as a forest area and then southern hemisphere as the ocean area. So whenever the sun heat up the southern area, the ocean area, and then the, the concentration of uh, uh, greenhouse gases will be much higher than the, when the sun uh, exposed the northern hemisphere. This is the the ideal uh, role of the ocean. So the role of the ocean uh, for climate change is uh, to absorb the excess of the uh, greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. This is the major component, the major role of the uh, ocean for the you know, greenhouse gas. So, and, that, and then I will move a bit to the adaptation of sea level rise. This is uh, what happened we have uh, especially in the country, in the tropics, in the equator like this. So we have to respond to the uh, sea level rise. So we have the problem, for example, I give you, this is uh, the Mekong area in the Vietnam area. Uh, we have so many paddy, paddy field area is considered affected by the 
uh, water coming, water intrusion coming from the sea to the land, something like that. So the next problem I, I will introduce you is uh, the the role of ocean is uh, for the ecosystem. Uh, some people say that the biodiversity and so on like this. But uh, the important thing is the uh, the loading. This is the river loading because so many cities lies in the coastal area and the loading to the ocean is very high. So this is uh, as many study before. This is in the 2005. Uh, they say loading of the ocean like this. This is a Japanese picture of the people put uh, so many loading, so many waste to the ocean. The ocean become a garbage. So people uh, put uh, garbage everything from pollutant, unsustainable fishing, environmentally fishing, and then marine pollution. Is uh, people just put in the ocean? This is our problem. But I will notice. Um, this is two study uh, on the left is my team study by Huang et al. 2017, and on the right is uh, the plastic debris study by Labrador et al. the same year. So this is a study of uh, uh, how many uh, how many loading, how many waste put in the ocean by people or uh, the civilization adapt to the coastal city and so on like that. So this is a problem for us uh, how we to cope with the ocean and so on like that. So this is a climate change and also for the study by uh, that we put ocean into the risk and the loading too much of the ocean uh, life system. Thank you very much. I think this will be uh, uh, inviting you to discuss about this later and so on like that. Thank you very much for the time for me again. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Edwin, uh, for the very uh, interesting uh, presentation on the climate change concerns, threats, also some examples on what is happening in Indonesia and in the region on environmental issues. Uh, we will keep, uh, I see there are a couple of questions coming in. Perhaps what I can uh, encourage the speakers uh, to do is if you'd like, you can probably try to answer that online uh, in the Q&A uh, function that you see on your screen. Or oh, some of this we can keep it uh, for the panel discussion session later. So uh, please use the opportunity to do so. Um, now uh, we will move on to the next speaker, um, and uh, Professor Narnia is a is a person that uh, uh, I, I really admire in terms of the uh, work uh, that she's done on blue economy, uh, and that would be the topic that she'll be uh, covering this afternoon. Uh, just to briefly introduce Professor Narnia. Uh, she's currently the executive director of uh, the Democracy Governance and Service Delivery Research Program at the Human Sciences Research Council and also an adjunct professor of the Nelson Mandela School of Law at the University of Fort Um Professor Narnia, without further ado, I pass the floor to you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. I am just trying to get my slideshow to work. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity um, to be here. And uh, well, Cheryl has uh, known me for a while now, and I've known her through my work in the Indian Ocean Rim Association, uh, where I was chairperson of the academic um, uh, group for two years during the time that South Africa chaired. So what I want to do is try and share some lessons um, from the Indian Ocean Rim Association that can be applied to any other region um, of the oceans. Uh, we've done a lot of work on the blue economy um, in the Indian Ocean, and I think these are very valuable lessons. So I'm first going to look at the concept of the blue economy, and then the approach of IORA to the blue economy and then how we move to what I call the blue future. So the Club of Rome, as early as 1972, um, stated that global industrial output per capita would reach a peak around 2008, followed by a rapid decline. Global food per capita would reach a peak around 2020, followed by a rapid decline. Global services per capita reached peak around 2020, followed by a rapid decline. And global population reaches a peak in 2030, followed by a rapid decline. 
So this Club of Rome report really showed us as early as 1972 that we needed to start thinking about the limits to growth. And of course, this applies to the oceans as well. Sorry, wrong one. So ocean resources, according to the World Wildlife Fund and the UNDP, the ocean has the greatest diversity of life on Earth. The surface of the ocean absorbs up to 50% of the heat from the sun and up to 30% of the carbon dioxide produced by humans. Ocean waves have the potential to be a sustainable renewable energy source and over 3 billion people depend on marine and coastal diversity for their livelihoods. So the United Nations Conference on Sustainable Development in 2012 stated the following, ocean seas and coastal areas form an integrated and essential component of the Earth's ecosystem and are critical to sustaining it. So the blue economy is seen as an alternative development model and we need policy discourses around this. We need to do two things generate employment, and I come from the African continent, so we know very much in South Africa included that we need to generate employment. But we also need to facilitate inclusive and sustainable growth. And this must be a balancing process. Here is just a picture of some of the um, areas that the Blue um, deals with, and uh, I'll, I'll look at this in a little bit more uh, detail later, but you can see there are many elements of it. Um, fisheries being uh, something that has been mentioned before, as well as waste management. Um, there you can see marine tra transport and tourism and climate change, renewable energy are all important aspects of the blue. So um, in a a book that I wrote with Professor Atri in uh, 2018, uh, we said that the blue economy is regarded as an alternative model of development in international policy discourse. So this alternative model of development is not about exploitation. It is about sustainability and inclusiveness. In terms of the RIM Association, we are in the process of developing new policy documents and strategies to maximize the development from a blue economy perspective. So, so not an ocean economy. Ocean econ economy doesn't include the concept of sustainability. But uh, Professor Colgan, who's an expert in this area says, we have a lot of documents and a lot of, but we are not doing much. We are not implementing what needs to be implemented. So he says they're in the last. Uh, so persuading people to act is not the same thing as deciding what action to take. So we know that we need to act, but what actions must we take? A little bit about the Indian Ocean Rim Association, which was established in 1997 by our then um, president, uh, Nelson Mandela, who visited India and spoke about the richness of the Indian Ocean. We have 22 member states bordering the Indian Ocean and nine dialogue partners. One of them here is Germany. So, and we have a number of members of the Indian Ocean Room Associa Association, yeah, including Indonesia and Malaysia. So the purpose of IORA is to build and expand understanding and mutually beneficial cooperation through a consensus-based evolutionary and non-intrusive approach. The main objection is cooperation for sustainable growth and balanced development through regional economic cooperation. So IORA only recently really started uh, thinking about the blue economy. Um, and you can see only in 2015, we had the first Iora Ministerial Blue Economy Conference, but the outcome was very positive. The blue economy paradigm is founded on the ecosystem approach, including science-based conservation of marine resources and ecosystems as a means to realize sustainable development. 
So here you can see that it is a very progressive interpretation of the blue economy and an interpretation that is internationally recognized as well as part of SDG 14. So the importance, we know what the importance is really, but we need to facilitate cooperation and improve capabilities in the blue economy across topics. And of course, as we've been uh, told previously, and what is really true is one world, one ocean. Um, but in the case of Iora, we have um, unified and cohesive regional organization with common interests. So the common interest is the ocean. Um, and we have the ocean in common. So this overcomes our political, our social, economic, and cultural differences. And we'll hear something about culture uh, um, later on. We've also spoken about the role of science um, in achieving this. Transdisciplinary research is necessary. So not only the natural sciences are important here, the social sciences and the humanities are also important in developing an understanding of life and the ocean. And we need to address mutual developmental priority aspirations. Sorry, just going to the next page. Um, this is just something interesting that I, I saw, you know, the, the tropics and the Indian Ocean overlap. Um, and what these are in the, the red dots are uh, coral reefs. And you can see there the concentration of coral reefs around the uh, Western Indian Ocean, and particularly there around Indonesia, um, going down to Australia. So you can see that the ocean is very rich here in the tropics and in the Indian Ocean. But these coral, coral reefs are bleaching. Um, environmental degradation is happening, illegal and unregulated fishing, and this affects everything about the ocean. Um, this is a very simple map. It's not a detailed one as shown earlier, but just to show the trade routes in the Indian Ocean. So I think about 30% of the world's trade um, by sea goes through the Indian Ocean. It's not a very large ocean. Um, and of course, these trade routes by sea are very um, dangerous in many ways in terms of the pollution of the ocean. Of course, trade is important, but we need to also consider the damage. The tropics are also very well known for their wealth in fish and their contribution to food security. So the sectors of the blue economy in terms of Indian Ocean Rim Association are fisheries and aquaculture, renewable ocean energy, ports and shipping, climates, hydrocarbons and seabed minerals, marine biotechnology research and development, tourism, and ocean knowledge clusters and uh, SIDS, small island development states and least development countries um, are also cross-cutting areas. So you can see here, there's an unfortunate mix really between exploitation and sustainability because we know, for example, that um, marine biotechnology research and development is necessary, but there's also a lot of exploitation going around in terms of oil and gas. So we need to look at the blue economy within a social context. Um, and here I try to do so. So we need responsible economic activity and inclusive development for job creation. Um, and there was a question in the chat box asking about this, you know, how, how, do, how can we convince businesses to be responsible about the oceans? It's a very good question because businesses really are about profit. So we need environmental protection and sustainability as well. Um, social justice, ocean justice, climate justice, very important. And also part of this that is essential is human well-being. And we have something now that is recognized by the G20 as the One Health Initiative. The One Health Initiative is human well-being, is part of 
ecosystem and ocean and environmental well-being and vice versa. So the challenges, the numerous challenges, uh, we have rapid degrading ocean resources um, because of unsustainable development. We have climate change and pollution, really surprising uh, statistics from the World Wildlife, World Wildlife Fund, 26% increase in ocean acidification over the last 10 years and 18,000 pieces of plastic litter every square kilometer of the ocean. And this is st statistic from 2018. We have excessive marine resource, resource extraction and the destruction of habitats. And that's why we need, for example, marine protected areas. Human capital is still required to innovate blue economy sectors. We need to look at it in new ways. Sectoral and fragmented management of the activities in the ocean. And so, although I'm looking at a regional approach, it's very, very important for us to work across. And then we need to develop a conscious, consciousness of what the blue economy really is. So, an effective blue economy entails much more than GDP growth. Acknowledgement and mitigation of environmental effects of industry, investment in and better use of science, data, innovation, and technology to shape management and governance decisions, effective, inclusive, and active participation by societal groups, women, local communities, indigenous groups, and marginalized and unrepresented groups, especially important in developing methodologies such as transdisciplinary research and measuring the social impact of the blue economy. So there is a triple bottom line here. Decision-making in terms of the integrated economic, social, environmental needs for optimal benefits all around. So what can we do? It's essential to fill the data gaps. You must in research on key economy, blue economy sectors. We need a collaborative approach with NGOs and social movements, non-governmental organizations and social movements involved in advancing blue economy issues. And we must ensure community participation in policy making and decision making. So it's a democratic process. As you will see, Stowe says, we are all in the same boat. So lastly, a blue economy, a healthy future, would demand a concerted effort by researchers, policymakers, and sector industries to work together to prevent over-exploitation, to protect the environment, and to avert the worst of the climate crisis. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Nelnia, for uh, the very informative presentation, as always. Enjoyed the presentation. Thank you. Um, Thank you I would very agree, much. I would agree with the pointers uh, made by Professor Nanya, where in one hand we have blue economy, if rightly implemented, would become a solution, probably also to address the 10 ocean decade challenges that uh, Dr. Martin uh, highlighted earlier. However, it can also become uh, areas of issues uh, if uh, not uh, carried out in the right way. It, can, it would become uh, issues or challenges for sustainable development if we do not understand the principles behind blue economy in the right uh, sense of it. Uh, now, uh, moving on to the next uh, speaker, uh, we have with us uh, Mr. Kwek Yu On, uh, who is a, a friend and a person that I've, I've known for a bit now in the government system. Uh, he is, by background, a marine biologist, uh, but currently he uh, serves the civil service uh, especially on biodiversity conservation policy. Uh, he has also been very active on ocean conservation issues and so on. And today he will be sharing with us a very important aspect on uh, ocean governance, which is uh, definitely the youth perspective. Uh, with that, uh, I'll uh, pass the floor to you. Thank you so much, Cheryl. Um, can you hear me? Uh, yes. Okay, thank you so much, Cheryl. Uh, I am uh, very pleased to be invited to today's session. And uh, also, I realized that yesterday was your birthday. So let's all uh, people here in the webinar wish Cheryl a very happy belated birthday. 
Uh, without further ado, I'd just like to uh, share my slides. Um, I'm very uh, pleased that uh, there were maps in the slide and uh, I guess I chose the right theme for today's uh, presentation. I, I don't claim to be an expert in uh, marine biology or uh, uh, a lecturer like the previous uh, few speakers, but um, I hope today what I can do is actually represent the youth uh, well in terms of uh, marine environment and marine environment. And, and the theme for today was the future belongs in the tropics. I would say the future belongs to the youth. And uh, uh, today's is a reminder that, uh, of that in, on the eve of the UN decade on ocean science. Uh, my name is uh, Kwek, uh, or some people call me Yuan, and I, uh, aside from being the server service, I, uh, along with a few friends, set up Reef Stakes, which is the first uh, marine team role-playing card game in Malaysia. That is not what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about youths. Since I don't have much time, these are the four topics that uh, was laid up for me. I'll talk about the position of youth first. Uh, then I'll go on to talk about what youth can do in their respective uh, field, their respective uh, uh, advocacy. And then I would like to convince everyone here to believe in youth by giving some pointers on why you should believe in youth and a little bit of personal reflection towards the end. So what is the position of youth in this whole discourse in, in uh, I guess, uh, governance and uh, environment and uh, related to you know, conventions and so on? Um, there is no one agreed definition of youth. The UN thinks youth are between 15 to 24. This is the definition. For Malaysia, youth or Belia is 18 to 30. And actually, UN gives freedom to uh, different countries and different agencies to define youths in their respective way. Uh, as for the current world population, you can see uh, the progression or the percentage numbers of youths along the years. Um, we, today, we have 1.2 billion youths using the UN definition, uh, 15 to 24, which make up about 15% of the population. But if you look at this graph, what it shows you is actually a large portion of the societies between 25 and 64. For me personally, these are also youth. And because they have the energy to do work, to make change. And so youth actually make up a very big percentage and moving forward will make up a larger percentage of the world. Um, the uh, role of youth actually have been recognized in 1965 under uh, one of the peace uh, conventions. But in terms of environment, in 1992, the big Rio uh, Declaration, which is also the year I was born, uh, recognizes youth in uh, Principle 21, whereby the creativity, ideas, and courage of youth should be mobilized to forge a global partnership in order to achieve sustainable development and ensure a better future. Also, you, you see uh, in, in the 20 odd principles, youth is a single principle as own, uh, highlighting the importance of youth in this uh, discussion. And from this real convention, of course, we have the three sister conventions, UNFCCC, CBD, and UN, all have permanent youth uh, representations during discussion. So uh, that is why youth is important and youth have always been given a voice. But how much of that voice is translated into actions? I, I personally feel uh, youths have been doing a lot on the ground. And um, for, for youths, for example, uh, who have ideas, who are entrepreneurial. You can look at Boyan Slat, who created the uh, ocean cleanup. And, uh, you know, we have one interceptor in Klang River. So, you know, these kind of uh, so, uh, tangible solutions that youth can contribute to the world. Uh, besides that, uh, youth has also been very active in, uh, say, community conservation, working with governments, working alongside governments, and so on. And here are some of uh, the people I look up to in Malaysia, Dr. Luisa, Pelf, Elvin, all work on the marine sector. I'm sure, Cheryl, you also uh, uh, know them. Um, and, and they have contributed greatly towards the policy making, uh, the action on the ground, the community conservation. So I feel that youth have a lot to offer in that sense. Uh, the youths have also been very influential in improving understanding of certain uh, items. For example, uh, the youths created the first guide on the CBD, which I think many countries have, have used to improve their understanding of these uh, com often complex uh, discussions. And uh, youths are also the ones that create these very vibrant, very uh, good infographics, uh, getting people to understand about the issues at hand. And youths, like I said earlier, has always been part of that. And uh, uh, if they're not with the policymaking sphere, you know, they are probably out there trying to uh, bring their governments or make the people who are in power, uh, how to say, uh, 
actionable and you know question what they've done and so i'm sure you all know about greta thunberg and and how much action she has inspired throughout the years uh, now um, the next part is on uh, why you should believe in youth and i think everyone here was a youth at some point of time and you can kind of remember or maybe you are still youth so uh, which is great uh, and you kind of kind of remember uh, what is the energy the enthusiasm you had at that time and maybe you can relate to me in this sense that uh, youths have the energy and potential. Uh, Margaret Mead once said in this very famous term, uh, never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing it ever has. And this, of course, applies to youth. Um, we might be small, uh, a group that is small uh, today, but uh, one day we will be there to um, uh, make changes that we feel that are needed. And so that is uh, the point. The second point I'd just like to bring is also uh, intergenerational equity. Uh, the concept whereby uh, the decisions are being made by people who are much older, uh, boomers, you know, uh, or even much older, uh, uh, that will affect, disproportionately affect to that matter, people who are much younger. And this is where intergenerational equity comes in. Uh, the, the, the saying that we do not inherit the earth from our ancestors, but we borrow it from our children. Hence, uh, I always feel that the youth have to have a voice and make use of their voice to the best of their ability. Um, now, this was a, a survey that was done by the Global Change Makers on how many percent of people believe in climate change. Over 90% of young people strongly agree uh, that humans are responsible for climate change, whereby much lower uh, in uh, the older generation. But then again, the older generation are not going to live on this earth in the next 30 years. It's the younger people who are going to live on the earth. So that's where the concept of intergenerational equity has to come in and say that the youth have to have a larger say on the decisions that will affect uh, future climate, uh, future ocean, and so on. Um, uh, and this last one, I really like, uh, youth may be 16% of today, but they are 100% of the future because we'll all grow up and someday be in positions where we can make that decision. So hence, um, I also like to quote uh, Tun Mahathir, our uh, fourth and seventh prime minister, uh, probably the last sentence on whose hands should we leave the fate of this nation, if not to the younger generation, uh, saying that, of course, the graying generation will go and will have to be replaced by the youth. Um, and uh, just probably ending my presentation on uh, several personal reflections on how the youth can uh, contribute and how um, uh, I have gone through uh, you know, several uh, discussions and several uh, experiences as a youth in, say, the policy sphere or the environment sphere, um, whereby it, it, there's, there's a lot of times uh, jobs expect you to have experience, uh, youth uh, to have experience. Um, and so where we come in is that uh, we build the capacity to the uh, experience that uh, we want to have or the job that we want to have. Uh, and, 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 and this is where you know, we, do, we do site courses, we do uh, uh, various different uh, you know, organizations and, and uh, getting to know people and so on. So this is part of uh, the youth preparing to, to go into say the workspace or to make changes. And then um, uh, what, what, I've, what I've realized is that um, I've been very lucky to get uh, a lot of uh, good mentors, a lot of good bosses, uh, you know, Dr. Naim, Chinusham and so on, who have been very supportive of uh, youth voice and um, I think the important thing here for youth is that uh, to be able to uh, give very uh, good comments, very constructive comments, and also to some extent bide our time, wait, wait for the chance to, to uh, come in with those comments and not so much, you know, just very uh, energetically go. Um, and of course, there are so many youth out there who share the same aspirations, share the same knowledge. Uh, and with Restakes, we've done that uh, to work with fellow youth uh, to, to, to achieve the same goals. And uh, last but not least, uh, once we are in that position to make a change, uh, we are able to pay it forward uh, through sharing of experiences to other similar youth. So then um, it, you're not the only person who, who, who uh, makes those changes. You have this coalition of friends. Uh, it could be in your own country, it could be in the world to uh, together with you make those changes. And I feel, uh, I mean, with Reef Stakes, we have a uh, respawn trying to get um, more uh, Malaysian youth into marine conservation. So i uh, just like to end, I only have seven seconds left on, uh, remember the 1965 uh, uh, peace accords where the youth was specifically mentioned. And this is uh, 
very important because uh, it, it, it says a lot about the youths and the youth thinking at that time. And I think it still resonates today, whereby uh, young people must be conscious of their responsibilities in the world they will be called upon to manage and should be inspired with confidence in the future of happiness for mankind. You know, it's quite airy-fairy in a sense, but uh, I think we all, who were once youth at that time, should give more opportunity to youths uh, to make that difference. And, and, and I guess uh, with that, I end uh, my presentation. Thank you so much, Cheryl. Looking forward to the discussion. Thank you so much, Greg, for the very inspiring presentation. Uh, congratulations also for the very uh, I would say excellent work that you're doing on, on ocean governance and conservation in Malaysia. And I hope you continue to inspire people, not just from Malaysia, from the region and also at the international level. I think you have put it in a very right perspective where youth, indeed, uh, the future belongs to the youth. And there's uh, ever increasing platforms and opportunities given to youth, even in international forums and so on, where they have a voice. Uh, on ocean governance matters, management, conservation, and so on. So very rightly put. Thank you so much, Greg, for the uh, for sharing with us. Thank you, thank you. Uh, presentation. Um, and we'll move on to the final presentation. Uh, and not least important, it's a very important area. Um, we'll be hearing on traditional knowledge and livelihood, uh, which will be presented by my dear friend and colleague. I must say, I first started working on blue economy with uh, uh, Dr. Mariko, uh, who is actually from uh, PEMSI originally in the Philippines, but she has very kindly agreed to speak to us. She is currently in the US, uh, so you can imagine the time zone that uh, Dr. Mariko is currently in. Um, just as a very brief uh, introduction, she's currently an international consultant for the Asian Development Bank's project on stock-taking study for benchmarking sensible management of EEC in the Pacific. She's also the team leader of the uh, AFD funded project on integrated coastal management uh, in the region. Uh, she has got a very rich experience backing her up in terms of uh, the work that she has done under PEMC before in the region. Uh, and a very, very pertinent speaker to, to speak to us on uh, traditional knowledge and life. Uh, Mariko, I pass the floor to you. Thank you. Okay, can you see my slide? Yes. Okay, good day everyone. So I'll be discussing the traditional knowledge and sustainable livelihoods and the healthy ocean. Um, I'll start the, my presentation on the value of the ocean. So the source of uh, wealth of countries, we have the um, ocean wealth. And what is ocean wealth? We have the produced capital and natural capital. So. Um, earlier, we had a presentation on the blue economy. So we have the produced capital from the different ocean economic activities, which are already captured in the national income accounts. And we uh, measure this from the gross value added uh, of these different sectors. But in addition, um, the ocean also provide values that are not captured in the market. So we have these different ecosystem services so the provisioning, supportive, regulating, and cultural services. Although most of the provisioning services are already captured in the GDP, but not these three um, values of ecosystem services, especially the cultural uh, services. And this is where the traditional knowledge comes in. So for the East Asian Seas region, um, the ocean economy generates about $1.4 trillion. Uh, it's about 3 to 87% of the GDP of the countries uh, in this region. And it also produces um, 50 mil 54 million jobs to these people. And on the ecosystem services, there are different valuation studies. And one study showed it's around $1.5 trillion. So it's even higher than the produced capital. So we really have to look at uh, the measuring the natural capital. The same in the Pacific Island countries, where in this uh, Pacific Island countries rely on healthy oceans to support their fisheries and tourism uh, sector. And the role of traditional knowledge is in ensuring the health of their oceans and biodiversity to support uh, lives and livelihoods. So what is traditional knowledge? So the other source of wealth of a country is the social capital. 
And traditional knowledge can be considered social capital. It's the core, it embodies the core of indigenous people's identities, cultural heritage, and livelihoods. Uh, traditional knowledge is a set of knowledge, know-how, um, innovations, skills and practices that are developed, sustained, and passed on from generation to generation within a community and often forming part of its cultural or spiritual identity. So it's now recognized that indigenous knowledge about land and species conservation, organic farming, sustainable fisheries, traditional medicines, and biodiversity management is important to keep the oceans healthy. So what is the value of traditional knowledge? So traditional knowledge is based on this principle of the circle of life. Traditional knowledge is the source of traditional use and management of lands, territories, seas, and resources with indigenous agricultural and fishing practices that care for the earth without depleting the resources. So traditional knowledge underlines the indigenous people's holistic approach of life. Indigenous perspectives are founded upon interconnectedness, reciprocity, and the utmost respect for nature. So it is proven to enhance biodiversity and in maintaining healthy ecosystems. So part of this traditional knowledge is that what we call the traditional ecological knowledge. And this is important in uh, ocean science and in the overall ocean governance. So what are these traditional ecological knowledge? This includes the locality specific knowledge, including the environmental linkages within these localities. It's a knowledge about physical processes such as ocean currents, upwellings, and meteorological events. It also includes the customary ecosystem management and sustainable harvesting practices. Also in monitoring wildlife population and fish migration. So uh, this is important in the ocean science because many scientific studies of local ecosystems would not have been possible without the knowledge base of indigenous people helping the researchers. And traditional ecological knowledge is also recognized now in the process of developing an international legally binding instrument under UNCLOS on the conservation and sustainable use of marine biodiversity located in areas beyond national jurisdiction. Because uh, as uh, shown in earlier slides, most of the oceans are open seas and beyond national jurisdiction. Now, traditional knowledge also uh, supports sustainable livelihoods. So when we combine the natural capital, the, the social capital from indigenous knowledge and ocean governance, this support um, sustainable livelihoods. So protecting biodiversity to, through policies and plans that integrate traditional knowledge will protect and sustain lives and livelihoods. So it's a win-win uh, solution for livelihood and environment. And if you look at the uh, small scale fisheries or artisanal fish, fishing, uh, the small scale fish is a big number. Although most of the, um, like in the ocean economic accounts, they focus more on the large scale fishers because of the contribution to revenues and to taxes and fees. But it's important because it's a major source of employment for millions of people. And the, the catch, annual catch from, for domestic human consumption is much higher from small scale fisheries than from the large scale fisheries. And in the East Asian Seas region, uh, the number of fishers in this region accounts for 38% of the total number of fishers in the world. And what are examples of this ecological in and cultural information from traditional knowledge? Uh, it includes the important places for fishing and gathering diverse species, seasonal routes for when and where different species are harvested, traditional ways of managing marine resources and areas, traditional fishing, gathering, food preparation methods. Also important cultural and archeological sites uh, are also embodied in this traditional knowledge. Also the travel and trade routes of indigenous people, like, the, like in the Pacific Ocean, which, uh, which is the source of cultural identity and also the observed changes or trends in species abundance and distribution over time. So these are vital information from the elders and from the traditional 
fishers and marine harvesters. And this information support marine planning and uh, information-based decision making. Okay, again, examples of this traditional knowledge in conservation. Uh, example is the folk taxonomy in Micronesia, the species knowledge for conservation in Kiribati, the taboo areas or sacred sites. Uh, there's also specific uh, prohibitions on certain species, which are also area and time-based restrictions like uh, the Sasila in West Papua in Indonesia, uh, and these seasonal and area closures create networks of refuge. There are also restrictions on certain types of gears, uh, prohibitions on certain types of behavior. There are also the totemic restrictions and also food avoidance. So all of these are important for maintaining healthy oceans and diversity, for climate resilience and for sustainable livelihoods. So to summarize, what is traditional knowledge and why is it important? Well, because traditional knowledge supports food security, health, and sustainable livelihoods. It's valuable not only to those who depend on it on their daily lives, not only the indigenous peoples, but it's also important for modern industry, agriculture, and fisheries, as um, it contributes to uh, enriching ocean science, as well as for uh, information on te technical, ecological, and medicinal and other biodiversity related knowledge. So traditional men's medicines is now being recognized as part of a marine biotechnology. And it, therefore, uh, traditional knowledge complements science-based policy, planning, research, monitoring, and conservation programs. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mariko, for the uh, very informative, interesting presentation you have uh, given to us today. It is definitely an area that's not uh, spoken of too much in most of the instances. It's something that's very crucial, yet uh, not really the center of attention in many cases. It's very important to understand the role of traditional ecological knowledge and sustainable livelihood. And I think it's very timely with the theme of uh, the forum today where we've actually uh, covered this topic as well. Thank you very much once again. Um, with that, uh, I think we've completed all the uh, presentations uh, for uh, the session today, and we can now uh, straight away move into uh, the panel discussion where all the speakers would be joining uh, to further dwell on to some of the uh, major areas that has been mentioned and to go into further details. Um, at the same time, I also noticed that there are quite a number of questions and thank you to the panel speakers who has been uh, answering this online. And I urge you to try to look at uh, some of the new questions and see if you want to take it up online or uh, if not, we can then take it in the uh, session uh, now. Uh, now, just to start the ball rolling, I'll just like to quickly recap some of the major issues that has been mentioned, some of the major areas that has been mentioned. Um, for once, I would uh, definitely like to bring to uh, attention again what Professor Martin has uh, presented in his keynote. The ocean decade provides a common framework for countries to achieve the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. I think it is, a, it is an excellent opportunity for national, regional and international cooperation to contribute to the UN processes as well as to relevant SDGs on the oceans and resources. And at the same time, to meet the needs of the society. We've heard the diverse areas that has been mentioned, uh, both in terms of a privilege as well as threats and concerns where we've uh, covered uh, extensively climate change, uh, blue economy, uh, uh, youth perspective, uh, as well as traditional knowledge. But there are various other issues as well that probably we should uh, look into and dwell a little bit further to try to tackle some of the concerns that has been uh, highlighted in the presentations earlier, for instance, the 10 ocean decade challenges could be one. Um, so with that uh, in mind, I'd like to perhaps pose uh, uh, important questions to the panelists uh, to start off with. Um, when we look at the different uh, regional priorities and uh, actions and uh, activities that are already going on, uh, how would we try to address in terms of, you know, how would you see the key priority areas to be for the tropics to achieve the ocean-related 2030 agenda 
and why do you think those should be the key priority areas? Because it's very rich when we look at the ocean decade and the information and the targets and the objectives that has been set. We need to look and focus into some of the priorities that we think we can achieve for the tropics. So I'd like to throw this question to the uh, panelists uh, today. Uh, Professor uh, Patti, maybe you would want to take uh, uh, the question as a start. Cheryl, I very much love to. First of all, what a wonderful panel and sets of intervention we have here. And I think it really shows the power of looking at the ocean, ocean sustainable development from the various perspectives, from the social science perspective, but also from traditional knowledge holders. And Quack, I was very impressed by all the activity from the next generation. But Cheryl, let me just say, to me, that the tropical region is really an exciting one, as we heard a lot about from Muslim and others, how important it is to the world. But when you look across, uh, for example, the 10 science challenges that I laid out uh, for the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development, they all apply to the tropics. So it's, I think it might be very hard for a region of the world as large as the tropics to say, this is the one thing which is most important to us. It is true though, when when you get more closer to a locale, uh, that that might be so. You might be in a region where, for example, uh, what Maria Cross mentioned, artisanal fishing is so important to the livelihoods in your local community, clearly then the food issue is most important to you. You might live in a big city where the issues around pollution, global trade and connectivity is the area that is part of your life. And there are some actions we can pursue in that area or you're in a network of educators, uh, next generation builders, future thinking, Quack and his colleagues, these early career ocean professionals around the world, they have some areas that they're really keen on. But I would say from where I stand, Cheryl, I would find it very interesting to discuss that, but I'd be very surprised if the tropical region of the world could focus on one thing only, and they would all agree on that. I think the 2030 agenda is an indivisible agenda, and it is also true in the tropics. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Martin. Excellent, excellent pointers. I, I'd like to follow up on, on that uh, remarks by Professor Martin, perhaps to now throw it to uh, Professor Narni and Dr. Uh, Mariko, for the reason being that uh, Mariko has worked extensively in the Southeast Asian region, or I would say the East Asian region, whereas Professor Nanya has very uh, extensive experience in the Indian Ocean region. And I think it would be excellent to hear from your uh, perspective as to what would be some of the key areas that you think should be uh, across uh, the board in terms of you know, what topics should be looking at. Um, thank you, Cheryl, for that question. Um, yes, it's complicated because uh, it's one ocean, but there are specific characteristics, perhaps, that we can look at in the tropics. Um, and one of them is um, coral reefs. So um, I think developing uh, extensive marine protected areas uh, would be a very important part of um, what should be done. Um, and we know that these must be, you know, proper marine protected areas. Um, and here also the whole issue of blue carbon could come in. So um, the planting of mangroves and um, those kinds of, of things that would assist in at least capturing um, the carbon dioxide the ocean does so very well. Um, and the other one that I was came to mind was really to control unregulated um, and illegal fishing uh, because food security is such an essential uh, and pressing matter for, for the world today. Um, and it's actually causing uh, tremendous tensions um, across the world. And uh, I think this is, this is important to ensure um, a, a safe uh, ocean as well. Thank you, Professor Nanya. Uh, Dr. Mariko, perhaps you can take this. Yeah. Um, okay. I presented the, some of the estimates of the ocean economy and, the, and there are already initiatives uh, in transforming the ocean economy to blue economy. Uh, 
for example, like uh, sustainable in sustainable fisheries, addressing IUU fishery. There are also a lot of initiatives on habitat restoration, particularly uh, restoration of mangroves uh, in this region, as well as uh, restoration of coral reefs and protection in terms of establishing uh, marine protected areas and even locally managed marine areas. However, there's uh, still a lack of protection for seagrass and for the deep sea uh, ecosystems. Um, in terms of uh, pollution management, there's now a lot of uh, uh, focus on plastics, but nutrients are still there and we seem to have um, quite forgotten about the nutrients and it's linkage to SDG 6 on wastewater, uh, also on the other SDGs on solid waste. So those are, I think, the gaps uh, in the region as considering that around 80% of wastewater is still being discharged without treatment uh, in this region. Um, also addressing sea-based pollution, like uh, also invasive species and ballast water, those are other uh, issues. Now, one thing I want to also point out is the need to measure uh, not just the produced capital, but also the natural capital and the social capital. So we bring together all these different sources of wealth of, uh, of nations. And usually we value what we have measured and we only measure the produced capital, but we need to look at measuring what we value. And that is the natural capital, traditional knowledge and social capital. And this is, uh, I think, uh, another action that should be, uh, be given priority because um, policies and plans should be based on uh, such information. Okay. Thank you, uh, Mariko. Um, we can also take uh, perspectives from a, a more national perspective from, uh, from Dr. Edwin as well as Quick in terms of what are some of the uh, challenges in terms of, you know, when we're talking about the three priority areas that you have uh, mentioned uh, in your presentation, what are the challenges or needs at the country level? Because we've seen it from the international level, uh, UN Ocean Decade, we've seen it uh, from the regional level as to what are some of the priorities and what should be done and so on. What, what about a country perspective? Uh, Professor Edwin, if you'd like to take that up. Okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Yes, uh, uh, this is uh, for country perspective. I think uh, one of the challenging idea is the vulnerability of the coastal area of the vulnerability and the resilient factor for the coastal community, for the coastal area uh, ecosystem. This means the, for the uh, uh, hazardous uh, uh, threat for the coastal ecosystem and community. I think that is the most challenging. That will include the climate change, the biodiversity, and the marine pollution. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Edwin. Uh, I would uh, rightly capture those points, climate change, pollution, and so on. It's definitely some of the bigger areas uh, that we need to pay attention. Uh, not just uh, in Indonesia, I think it's pretty similar in some of the other Southeast Asian countries as well, as also pointed out by the other panelists. Um, Kwek, you, you've got an extensive experience at the different levels. Although you covered youth today, I think you've got the experience on the biodiversity side, environmental management and so on. What would be you know, among the areas that you see as coming up as priorities, but also the challenges that we are looking at uh, in terms of you know, the future for the tropics? Oh, well, uh, thank you, Cheryl. I, I, I think, um... As you are aware, uh, for Malaysia, uh, ocean governance is a bit uh, complicated, uh, to, put it, to put it shortly. Um, it is spread across different agencies, different ministries, and also there are different levels of uh, capacity. So I think in the short term, uh, capacity building would be one of the uh, major things that we should uh, put in. Uh, if, I mean, for example, Malaysia is actually a maritime country. Uh, although, uh, and many of you might be aware, a lot of effort is put into the terrestrial 
uh, conservation rather than marine. So maybe maybe that that kind of information should be out there, and uh, uh, also uh, the recognition that uh, what agencies do what uh, and how you can be part of that the solution uh, should be put out there uh, as well. So I think that there's there's uh, not enough out there in terms of the Malaysia context. So in terms of the tropics. Um, there must be a strong coalition, I feel, uh, among uh, the tropical countries um, uh, and, and also supported by, uh, I mean, developed countries, of course, uh, in terms of uh, resource mobilization, um, uh, capacity building, technology transfer, and so on. And, and these are uh, uh, the things that are discussed at the CBD level, discussed uh, as the drivers uh, for, uh, you know, the change and, 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 uh, and, and the relevant policies, relevant actions that we need. So, I, I mean, I can talk at length about this and I probably don't want to take too much time. So, that's my short answer uh, to you, Cheryl. Thank you so much, Quack. Um, I'm just throwing out questions to bring out the, you know, thought-provoking uh, replies from all of you panelists. But I also realize there are questions in the uh, Q&A uh, uh, function on my screen which I think some of these uh, questions we're already addressing, but we'll, we'll move on to that as well. We've got at least 15 more minutes to try to cover this. Um, one other question that I would want to pose to the panelists who would want to take this up is, um, we like to see the tropics uh, leveraging on the 2030 agenda uh, of ocean science. Uh, but at the same time, we also acknowledge that there's so much already happening at multiple platforms on almost similar uh, subject areas. It's sometimes become a challenge for the country. It's sometimes become a challenge at a regional level to fulfill these obligations. Usually this comes up as one of the key areas in most of the expert discussions and so on. I would probably want to bring it up to uh, Professor Martin now to, to ask how do you, um, you know, foresee countries streamlining efforts at the different platforms, different levels, because we've, as we've rightly heard from the panelists, there's not one area, and I would totally agree with you, there's not one key area that we want to focus on. There's so many different areas, and sometimes these are also addressed under ASEAN, under TOPSI, under PAMSI, under Indian Ocean, under CPI, uh, and so on. There's so much happening. Um, uh, perhaps you can shed some light on that, uh, Professor Martin. Cheryl, thank you very much for this wonderful question, which indeed is one of the central challenges for those of us who uh, want to focus their work on the ocean, who want to see what the ocean dimension of the 2030 agenda looks like and how we can collectively across the ocean family, may I say, it make some impact. Uh, the, although there is excellent work happening in many areas, Cheryl, you mentioned some of them, but it's the collective impact that we want to generate, which is not so easy to get. Now, let me offer three areas of thought here. At the UN level, uh, which is uh, one of the areas that we do some work internationally on, um, there is probably on the order of 25 agencies who have somewhere, somewhere ocean in their portfolio. And for, in, for a large country or let's say a wealthy country like Germany, that's maybe possible to follow, but actually we don't. And for a, a smaller country, it's impossible to follow all these 25 programs and so on. So more than a decade ago, this initiative of UN Ocean was generated. It's the federation of the UN agencies that bring together their ocean portfolio and are meant to act as one. That has not been as impactful as it should have been. And my big wish for the decade of ocean science for sustainable development is to also empower again that UN ocean conglomerate of all the UN ocean agencies or the elements of those together to be more impactful full collectively. So this is not about one agency is the premier agency, it's about collective impact. Now, the, the same can be said uh, for other actors in the country. For example, in Germany, we don't have an ocean ministry. We have a science ministry, an environment ministry, an economic ministry, and a finance ministries. And only when they work together, we can see changes happening. That is not happening in Germany right now. We're not an ocean state like Malaysia or Indonesia is, so we don't have an ocean minister. My friends in Portugal have, you know, Cape Verde has an ocean minister, maybe some of your tropical countries do. But also in government, we have this issue that these things cut across different ministries and not often ministries don't like to work together. So again, here's an opportunity to derive a national ocean policy 
and in national sets of ocean governance rules that I think some of us have mentioned. And the third element I will bring out is also one about training, capacity building, and so on. A lot of wonderful efforts, a lot of efforts from NGOs, from schools, from universities, academies. But again, do they really add up to what we might call ocean literacy in a country? And my, my hunch is that in many places they do not. And it's we are more competing at times, those who are active in that area, rather than collaborating. So I think this decade has this unique opportunity to see, is it possible to bring out a, a national or uh, you know, across programs, uh, uh, program action for the ocean. And I would encourage at least all at the national level to think about setting up a national committee for the decade of, UN, uh, of the ocean and think about if that committee could bring together all the actors and really ask the question, maybe be stronger by providing collective impact than shining individually. The decade is all about bringing up the family as it were. Nobody is in charge, it's for all of us but really it's encouraging us to really build out this collective impact at our national or academies or institutional level to really bring everybody in together. And I think that's the challenge for me. We have a lot of great organizations, but maybe they are too small individually, but collective impact is what we're looking for. Thank you. Thank you, excellent, uh, Professor Martin. I think that really is the key, uh, key uh, element that we would want to look into, collective actions. We don't want to work in silos, we don't want to just uh, reinvent the wheel in some cases, but we want to make impactful. Uh, we want to achieve or derive impactful outputs, outcomes from this kind of engagement. And you've very rightly uh, actually covered quite a number of questions that we, we had in mind in terms of partnerships and so on, and how that could probably be done at the national level uh, to bring it to a you know regional impact and international impact. Very well said. Thank you so much for that, uh, Professor Martin. Um, um, Marico. Yes, Marico. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when we developed the National State of Oceans and Coast Reports in 10 countries in the East Asian Peace region, we brought together all these different uh, agencies and sectors to work on this report and do the blue economy assessment. So it was already a start of uh, overcoming the silo approach because when we develop these reports, we're able to know more about what each other is doing. And it also pushed us to do more actions because we were able to identify the gaps and the challenges. Now, there are more opportunities now for, um, for investments, for partnerships, for knowledge sharing, capacity development, um, especially uh, in this region. Um, only a few countries in East Asian Seas region has a national ocean policy. So like Indonesia, Korea, Japan, China, but not the other countries. In the Pacific island countries, around eight of them already have national ocean policies. But again, the issue is the weak implementation of these policies. So there are already a lot of environmental policies in place, but I think we have to focus on how we could better implement all these policies and how we can work with different sectors and different stakeholders, including the coastal communities. We have to hear from them because they know more about the issues on the ground. Thank you. Thank you, Mariko, for, for the pointers. Uh, that is definitely among the, the key areas that we've often uh, heard and uh, discussed. For instance, I'm, I'm also seeing this question popping up in the Q&A and also in the chat uh, function here where uh, participants are asking about national ocean policy. Yes, unfortunately, Malaysia, we have a draft which has not yet been uh, adopted. But at the same time, you have a very pertinent point where those countries that already have these ocean policies would want to look into the effective implementation of these ocean policies as well. That is another a key challenge that we need to look into. So one is to establish and one is to effectively implement it. Um, would any of the other panelists uh, pick up some of these questions that I think is a very rich uh, a discussion on pertinent areas? Um, Professor Narnia, would you want to uh, say something on that? Uh, I'd just like to add on the importance of communities. So they should be included in what we understand as stakeholders. Um, and in particular, artisanal uh, fishing. So, um, 
women are very much involved in this area. And so I think uh, women's voices and the mainstreaming of gender within all of these policies is also very important. Um, because most of the, the scientists who, who work on oceans are men, and um, we, we need to focus a little bit more on creating awareness amongst women um, and also starting at school. So, um, you know, we were talking about policies, but we also just, just generally awareness um, around these issues because school children in South Africa are not taught about uh, these important environmental issues, including the issues around the oceans when they're at school. Um, and they only really go into it when they go to university and they study marine sciences or whatever. So um, it is very important to create awareness. And I think that's why this oceans decade is so important because it's part of, of it is awareness raising about the oceans. Um, and also there is something in common that we can all look to uh, when, when we consider these things and that's the um, United Nations law of the seas. Um, where you know most of the law and governance uh, issues are articulated, um, and I think most of our countries are signatories, um, and it gives you all of the information around territories and so on. So I would also recommend um, creating awareness around uh, the international treaties. Thank you, thank you, Professor Narnia. To be fair to the uh, participants that has actually posed questions in the Q and A uh, chat box, uh, I just like to pick a few from here. I think there's a very interesting one where this question is actually from eight years old, and I think perhaps we should give a bit of importance to this. The question is, what if there are less fishes in the tropics? Are there any studies to show impact of overfishing in any one location is worse than the other? It's really asking what happens if there's less uh, fishes in the tropics? Are there studies to show? Uh, in, um, perhaps uh, any of the panelists would want to take this up? I think it's very interesting. It comes from a very young uh, participant, probably okay. with the age of the parents. Okay, I think. Uh, yes, Professor. For me, I think there are some study by the uh, FAO and so on like that. There are many. Uh, uh, study on the stock fish, fish stock, so how many fish stock are left uh, for fishing and so on like that. And then we can uh, imagine that uh, for country in the Southeast Asia, we are living in the marginal sea. Marginal sea is not the open ocean like Pacific uh, Ocean or the Indian Ocean. We are living in the marginal sea. So one, one of the sea we are facing every day is also facing by other countries. This is the fact that we are, we are living in. I think uh, the fact that that is uh, must be solved by political uh, negotiation, by trade lobbying, and so on like that. So I think it is a fact that is we are we are absolutely uh, overfishing. So on the way to do that, I think we must not only negotiation and uh, diplomatic and so on like that, but we have to do uh, what is. Uh, increasing fish stock by 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 the uh, harvesting the fish from the 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 place or the, the that we we have to I don't know uh, what is the term here uh, to grow your own fish in your in your platform what is uh, what is the term in, in science I forgot the term. But uh, aquaculture, you, uh, marine culture, yeah. Aquaculture, you must produce your aquaculture, marine culture, or whatever. The, this is also part of the blue economy. I think we have to increase that. I think we are living in the marginal sea. That is the, our basic rule of basic step. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Professor. Cheryl, can I maybe add yeah. one, one dimension to that? Uh, so I think the particular interesting uh, challenge for the tropical parts is we that the scientists and I'm not a fishery scientist, but I know some who do that. They have seen as the planet is warming. Lost uh, Professor Martin for a bit. Lost uh, Martin, if you can hear us. Yeah. 
it just froze. Hmm. Maybe you can, yeah. Is it better now? Oh, yes. Yes. Okay, sorry. So um, I was saying in the tropics where, uh, where the warming is happening as elsewhere, but some of the fish species like the warm environments and they're migrating toward the more temperate regions, so out of the tropics towards the poles in both hemispheres. So that means the tropics are particularly affected by the global warming with some of the fish migration areas. And the other area that Edwin was mentioning is the fishing pressure. Many of you have talked about it. Now, one way out of that, so why is that there? Because humans uh, like to consume fish and quite often large fish. But actually, there's very a lot of nutrition in algae and biovalves and also small fish, which is not the preferential food for humans, but it's actually great food. So I would also say, you know, reducing the market for big fish and marketing more the algae, the smaller food is, is a very much a sustainable opportunity in that arena. Uh, but the last point I wanted to bring in, which also adds to what Marie Kaur and others were saying, I think it is about time for all the regions to really set up uh, what we might call marine spatial planning or ecosystem-based management. So a rules-based set of, uh, for the region that you are a custodian over, that's the economic zone for the coastal states, and maybe the law of the sea can do that globally. But we do it on land, there's zoning on land everywhere, and we tend to not do it in the ocean, which is a recipe for disaster. Uh, so the rules-based management, the proper spatial planning informed by the knowledge holders from indigenous communities, from women's right holders, everything else, I think that is the way to the future for a more protected and, and smartly used uh, ocean. So where protection and use get zoned in and a national plan and a use plan and a zoning of the ocean gets articulated. I think this is a huge opportunity for the tropical regions to do that and collectively for the whole tropical ocean. I think that would bring us ahead against all the issues that we discussed. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Martin. Very timely uh, input there, Professor Martin, because there was a question where uh, someone with the name Si Chin Te did ask that this is very complicated. Is it really possible that we can achieve this? And I think we've rightly pointed out the mechanisms, the tools that we can actually use to address that. So thank you. Wait, I think uh, you, you would like to say something? Yeah, so just, uh, uh, I think uh, Ram, uh, your boy, I had, I had a very, very good question. I'd just like to you know address that. Uh, Aside from all the complex uh, scientific concepts that I mentioned earlier. So Ram, I, I think uh, we don't know for sure, right? The science is not out there on which part of the tropics, where, uh, which country of the tropics. So we always have this uh, precautionary principle, something like uh, when your mom says, don't go out and, and uh, on the streets because you'll be, you know, uh, something happened to you. So uh, I think science also uh, goes along in that sense. Let's not try to touch the environment so much in case something happens. Uh, that, that's my short answer uh, for Ram. Thank you. Thank you, Quick. Um, I think uh, um, with that, uh, yeah, Mariko. Yes, yeah, look for um, the question on the fish stocks. So they're different uh, species. So like for the Western and Central Pacific Fisheries Commission, they're looking at uh, certain species of uh, tuna, as well as uh, some iconic species like the sharks, whales, dolphins, and so on. Um, now, tuna is really being affected by uh, the, the climate change because of the tuna migration. At the same time, it's the over-harvesting uh, of tuna. So like uh, in the southern Philippines, the General Santo City was known as the tuna capital of the, the country and in, in the region but they've overfished the tuna and now they're uh, fishing in the Pacific. So they've done uh, arrangements on tuna fishing licenses in some countries uh, in the Pacific. So even uh, Indonesia, Vietnam are now fishing also in the Pacific Ocean, uh, having licenses that uh, agreements with the Pacific Island countries. So this is uh, an indication of how we have overfished our own uh, internal seas, our own uh, uh, oceans. And then it affects the municipal fisheries, the small scale fisheries, because uh, uh, you have commercial fishing being done inside the municipal fishing grounds. So again, displacing this is small scale fishermen. So there are a lot of uh, issues. Um, and then one 
action that was uh, being done is like having seasonal closures. But again, this will affect the livelihoods of these small scale fishers. So how do we balance uh, the fisheries management while taking care of the livelihoods of these small scale fishermen? So it's um, another issue in doing uh, this ecosystem based uh, fisheries management. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mariko, for those uh, pointers. Uh, definitely, but in an areas to look into. Um, with that, I think uh, uh, we're almost done here with the panel uh, session. And I think we've got a very interesting set of uh, points on what are the challenges, what are some of the priorities, how do we move forward in the tropics, what are some of the areas that we can you know, formulate in terms of cooperative uh, endeavors, uh, the tools that we can use, what are some challenges at a national level, regional level, and international level. I think it's very uh, nicely uh, uh, spoken of by the panelists uh, this, uh, uh, this afternoon. So with that, um, I enjoyed uh, moderating this session. I, I hope all of you benefited from the discussions uh, as well. Uh, for those that didn't manage to get your questions answered, I think what you can do is probably then later email the secretariat uh, or the speakers, uh, something like that. Yes, I see Sophia nodding there. Um, and with that, thank you very much once again. I'll pass it back to the secretariat. Thank you. Thank you very much, Cheryl. And also to all of the speakers that we had for the very um, fantastic uh, discussion. And certainly for myself, who is not an ocean person, um, I've certainly learned a lot from you know, all the presentations and all the question and answers. Um, and certainly, as what men uh, mentioned by Ms. Cheryl, um, you know, if you still have any questions you'd like to ask, um, you, know, you can continue to post the questions on the Facebook page uh, because this video is available on our Facebook page. So you can continue to post questions there, or you could also continue to email the secretariat. Um, I think the email is also available on the Facebook page, um, and we will, you know, get the uh, we'll be in touch with the uh, uh, speakers and try to get some answers for you. Um, so again, thank you very much, uh, Shara, and also all of the uh, panelists uh, and also the keynote speaker for that fantastic uh, webinar. So now I would like to invite Professor Mazlan to give some closing remarks and wrap up the webinar for today. Yes, thank you, Sophia. Okay, I think I'm, I can hear me. Thank you, Sophia. And I will echo Sufian's sentiments where uh, we like to thank everybody. But before I do the final thank you, I have a few things I have to do. First of all, uh, very quickly wrap up. I know um, Cheryl has also wrapped up. And I think we can all safely uh, conclude that the ocean decade uh, for ocean science uh, is going to be the major framework for whatever we're going to be doing. And in terms of the priority areas, which uh, I think are very important for us to identify, of course, it depends on many factors. Um, and that is a process you have to go through in the next decade. I think that's the whole idea. Somebody asked about resources uh, for this work. I know we've been to the Ocean Decade uh, website and there's lots of resources there, no ending, you know? So there it, it can empower all kinds of people you know, to take action, to get collective impact, etc. So the only thing left for me to do is to uh, give you the statistics for the polls. Uh, Vashita, can you share your screen or somebody should share the screen with me? The first, um, the first question, who's going to share the screen with me? Uh, Sufia? Okay, the first question was, uh, which sector of the ocean community do you belong to? Uh, I think because we want to know who were coming in and the majority of you was from ocean science and technology, nobody from the UN body, except for, I, I, I think we can consider Martin as uh, what from the UN body. Um, then the next thing will be the ocean policy and civil society. You know, we are very, very concerned that civil society gets involved in uh, all the work that uh, we do. So the next question was, uh, can you, uh, Vashi, next question? 
this is on what do you consider as the biggest environmental threat? We definitely want you to focus on the environment here, and we only want you to choose one so that we know what is, you know, utmost in your heart, in your heart, in your mind, and as expected, you all thought, most of you thought climate change was the most, uh, is the biggest threat followed by pollution. Pollution, not just plastics, but other kinds of pollution. Then it comes after that destruction of habitats, overfishing. Yes, and nobody, maybe nobody said from this industry uh, that uh, the, the environmental threat from oil drilling, etc. Okay, next four, please, um, Fashi. I asked a question on uh, for governance. I mean, we I did the, the the time is too short for me to have invited somebody from governance. You know, uh, the law of the uh, sea and all that. That I think might be a separate uh, webinar. It's so exciting. I'm from the space uh, sector, and the space sector is similar in terms of you know uh, international uh, commitments and all that. Uh, to the international law of the sea. So, what do you can say the most good aspect, aspect for, for governance, you know, and a lot of you thought international fishing was one, you know, uh, then ship, the shipping industry, and then, uh, oh no, sorry, sorry, conservation was, uh, you thought, the most critical, critical aspect for uh, ocean governance. Yep, followed by fishing. Uh, shipping and seabed mining. Okay, last question. I wanted to see what sort of actions you when you leave this webinar that you would go to, you know? And what, and what you, it, this is actually a question of what area uh, you are working in. Um, it looks like most of you will undertake some kind of action in protection. And I, I believe that even if you are staying at home, you could uh, undertake some action under protection because it's under citizen science and all that. That is followed very nicely by advocacy and public outreach. That too is very important, of course, in creating public awareness. And of course, we need to advocate to our policy makers. Um, I'm hoping that some of you will go home, uh, go back to your offices and start um, drawing up uh, ocean policies, uh, setting up groups, you know, and part, which is part of the governance uh, exercise. And as some of you probably are in the industry, uh, so you will take some action uh, connected to that. So those are the four questions I asked, um, just to get an idea of uh, what you're thinking, uh, what the participants' thinking is on the issues. So then, okay, then that's it from me then. I would like to thank you all again, the, uh, the speakers, naturally. Uh, we can't thank them enough for all the valuable insights. But of course, participants too for joining. Uh, uh, there are people from Canada. That means they are, you know, um, 3 a.m. in the morning, something like that. China, Germany, India, Indonesia, Japan, Malaysia, of course, Pakistan and Taiwan. Um, so that's uh, going around uh, the globe. So once again, uh, I would like to thank you for following us on this webinar. Uh, we will have another webinar uh, soon on the 29th of June in this series, uh, 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 focusing on the tropics, which is because we have the International Day of the Tropics on the 29th of June. Uh, so I hope you will join us too. We. Uh, I cannot share with you who our luminary speakers are. We had uh, 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 so many today. And please, uh, what is that word? Keep, um, uh, keep following us and we'll send you a save the date uh, poster or information soon. Again, thank you very much for uh, joining us today, both to the speakers and to all participants. For some of you, have a great day uh, for the rest of the day. And this, uh, thinking about the ocean, I love the fact that there's only one ocean. I love it, love it, love it. Uh, but the rest of you, have a good evening. And again, you can still think about uh, what you can do for the ocean. Thank you. Thank you very much. So um, just while you know everybody is still here, so on behalf of the organizing committee,
again, I would like to echo Prof Mazlan. Thank you very much to all of the speakers. For all of the attendees, um, you know, I, I understand that there's some of your colleagues who are unable to join the session. So feel free to share the webinar on Facebook, share it with all your colleagues. Um, and again, if you have any questions, do leave, uh, leave, leave the questions um, you know, on, the, on the social media or send us an email. So for, and for those of you who are interested in knowing uh, in the upcoming programs, uh, do follow us on social media and we will also send you emails to remind them. Um, so um, we hope to see you again at the upcoming webinars. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you very much for all of the speakers who are amazing. Um, and have a good day wherever you are. Bye. Bye-bye.